Hi folks, welcome to episode 117 of the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters. I'm Carl and I'm joined by Bo, and today we're going to be talking about something I know virtually nothing about, the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, I just skipped over this because from about, honestly, from about 1600 to 1800 on continental Europe, it's madness. And I remember, I remember um, when I first started studying history, I was doing it on my own. And so I'd read the Wikipedia pages of things first, then go and get a book that was relevant to whatever it was. Or I'd go and find the original source or something like that, just for, you know, for my own, just for the, the pleasure of reading it. And I looked at the War of Spanish Succession and, and just that time period was just like, yeah, I've got other things I need to learn. <laughs> uh, so I, I know that a lot happened, but I don't know very much about it. Right, yeah, it is a complicated story. There's loads and loads of characters, loads and loads of events, mm. loads. So this is a war that's sort of 13 years long. Mm. So if we're going to do it in even two or three hours, I'm going to have to skip over certain things, leave certain people out. So if there's anyone out there who's a massive fan of the War of the Spanish Succession, and they're a bit annoyed that I didn't even mention Admiral Chauvel or something, yeah. or didn't even mention much about the campaign in Northern Italy in 1706 or something. Um, well, I'm just going to have to leave some stuff out um, by design, because um, where we did the last one on Blenheim, and you said, let's do the, the whole thing, or what happened next at least. Yeah. Um, I've been re-reading up about the War of the Spanish Succession. I was fascinated by it at some point in my late 20s, because it's one of those things, if you really want to know about World War I, you end up at Napoleon like 100 years earlier. Mm. If you really want to know about Napoleon, you end up at like the Nine Years' War or the War of Spanish Succession like 100 years earlier, mm. and so on. You know, and if, if you want to try and join up things that happened in the sort of um, 15th, 16th century, if you want to join that all up with Napoleon, you're not going to be able to avoid it. And then... Well, just all these wars lead into one one another. Mm. Um, so I mentioned the Nine Years' War there. And so this is, in my mind, and some historians have said this, the War of the Spanish Succession is very much a continuation of that in all sorts of ways. The actual underlying motivation for it is different, but the, the sides are very similar. Mm. And it's about, all about the power balance in Europe. Yeah. Um, so that's ultimately what it is. Uh, where in the one we did on Blenheim, uh, spoke for a few minutes about the reasons for the war, uh, but if we go into a bit more detail here. So the bottom line is this, that the the King of Spain, Charles II, uh, uh, Habsburg, died childless, and the other two massive players in Europe, the King of France, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, the Bourbon King, and the Emperor of Austria, who's also the Holy Roman Emperor, so the King of Austria, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Leopold the First. They're the two big players. Mm. I suppose the other biggest player in Europe is um, William of Orange, King of England, and the Stadtholder of the United Provinces. So they're sort of the biggest players. But it's really a power struggle between the House of Bourbon and the House of Habsburg. Mm. And Britain doesn't really want either of them to inherit Spain. And then what the Spanish themselves want is sort of another... Thing. And then there's other players as well. So Bavaria, the elector of Bavaria, is a big player. He's nowhere near as big as the emperor. Whenever I talk about the emperor, I'm talking about the Austrian king or the king of France or the king of England, but they're still a big player. Another thing to mention straight off the bat is that the map of Europe, I will, of course, putting up maps, is very different. So northern Italy is completely broken up. There's all sorts of things like uh, Savoy, Piedmont, uh, or Savoie, you should probably pronounce it rather than Savoy, but I'll be saying Savoy. Um, that's its own thing, you know, like the the Milanese, i.e. Milan, that's mm. like its own thing. For anyone um, who's familiar with the modern map of Europe, it looks very different. Actually. Very different. Apart from England, which looks exactly the same. Mm. And that's one of the, you can you can find like videos on YouTube of uh, the borders of Europe over the last thousand years. And what what I find really interesting is the borders of England are basically the same mm. over the last thousand years, mm. and this has to have some effect on our mindset, you know, compared to the continental mindset where you can see borders changing and political entities growing and then collapsing and, you know, shattering into the constituent parts and things like this. And you just think, right, okay, there is a difference here. And so anyway, like it's, it's amazing how much Europe has changed. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there's been there was a lot of unification in the 19th century. Mm. So here we're talking about the yeah, the, yeah. the early 18th century. I mean, Britain becomes Britain in the middle of this war. Yeah. Uh, before that, we weren't sort of formally united with Scotland, the two crowns. Um, so that sort of happens in the middle of this war. And 13 years, it's sort of quite a tumultuous 13 years, um, not including this war. Loads of other things happen, um, not even including this war. Like, mm. for example, the unification of Scotland and England. Mm. Uh, but just to go back to Italy, like Venice is its own thing. The Papal States are their own thing. Um, Tuscany. Well, when you say their own thing, you mean sovereign states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's the Duchy of Moderna. Yeah in northern Italy, or the Duchy of Parma in northern Italy. Germany, obviously Bavaria's got its own sovereignty, like Prussia's got its own sovereignty, Hanover, um, like even Cologne is sort of more or less, it's a, bit, a lot of these things are a bit of a puppet, puppet states. But then you've got the Holy Roman Empire, which really is a patchwork of tiny, mm. pretty small little places all under in, in their own sort of league, if you like, which is the mm. Holy Roman Empire, which at this point, the 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 Austrians control. And then Austria itself has got a few, well, the Habsburg monarchy has got a few elements to it. There's Hungary is attached to it. Um, they've quite recently annexed, taken control of Transylvania, which is sort of modern day Romania-ish, taking yeah. it off of the Ottoman Empire. So that's one of the things to mention straight away is that this war comes after a string of wars in the late 17th century. You can see when I was reading about history, just on my own for fun, I was like, I'll come back to this bit. Yeah, so right away, <laughs> unless you really want to know about it, unless you're like making really yeah. an effort to yeah. figure it all out and who's who. And I haven't even started on the names of the people. Mm. So for example, just take the, the Habsburg family. There's sort of, it's, it's just a complicated story right away. Um, and we'll have to get into it when we start talking about Charles and things. Uh, but just to say, the string of wars running up to it. Um, so Louis the Fourteenth. that's one strand you can sort of hold on to because he's king of, mm. of France for sort of 70 years. So that's one person you can sort of hold on to at all times. I think that's a good way of getting your mind around history, especially a complicated portion of history. He's also a sort of powerful and prominent character. Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. You know, yeah. he dominates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, He dominates the whole thing, the Sun King. Yeah. So, like, he he's a good anchor in this Absolutely. time period, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, like, for example, if you want to understand the Elizabethan period, the whole of European history during the Elizabethan period, to anchor yourself onto Elizabeth Tudor hmm. is one of those things because she's a constant through it. Um, yeah. So, but that is another thing I would like to say just straight off the bat that you know this is a a complicated story, and I hope I don't get any of it wrong. Uh, but if I do, you have to cut me a little bit of slack because it's very easy to sort of bugger this story up. <laughs> there's a number of ways you could tell it. I'm going to do it more or less chronologically. Mm. But there's multiple theatres of war going on here. Last epochs, we did Blenheim. Yeah. In a sense, it's a very straightforward to story to tell. Mm. This happened, then this happened, and these were the results. It's one thing. Whereas this, there's basically four theatres of, of operations. There's Flanders which is basically Belgium, Holland, France, Luxembourg area. There's, there's the Rhine theater, i.e. sort of southern Germany. Um, there's the Italian theater all across northern Spain, uh, northern Italy, sorry. And then there's the Spanish theater. Loads of war goes on in and around Spain. Mm. So there's four different things going on all at the same time, or often all at the same time, to begin with, all at the same time. <laughs> And just multiple, multiple people and um, things, the politics of it change loads as well. Like, for example, one example, what Spain wanted at the beginning completely changes by the end. Um, in the middle of this, um, one of the, not Leopold I, but one of the um, Austrian Holy Roman Emperors, in the middle of it, because we play around with three different ones in the middle of this. One of them dies, and our, all of our politics change. Or at one point, the Whigs are ousted for the Tories, and just our entire war aims change, our view of the whole thing changes, stuff like that. So it gets complicated, like Savoy flips. So it's like that just makes calculations for everyone, including the historian looking back on it, completely different now, suddenly. Right. And things like that just happen lots. <laughs> 
So, okay, the wars leading up to, because this starts in 1700, uh, Charles II of Spain dies in, seven, in the 1st November 1700. Um, so, for example, you've got the, the Franco-Spanish War from 1635 to 59. And in the middle of that, basically, Louis XIV becomes king, quite young. And what he does, along with one of his great ministers, is reforms the French army to be sort of a world beater. Hmm. I often think to myself, I don't know if you do, if you ever were quantum leaped back in time, you, I would just start a research and development program to make my army the best thing it could possibly be, pump loads of resources and energy and money into it. Weirdly, I was thinking about this in the shower this morning. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I, was, I was thinking about the decline of Britain, actually, and it, it, does, it definitely is a consequence of us not being a world power and in competition because Britain never had the resources that other world powers had. And so what it had to have was the standards in order to be able to um, beat them on their own terms with less. And so we just had to be better. And now that we're not doing that, you can feel the slackening of civilization around us. Just the standards are going down and everything's falling apart. And so, yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking, you know, well, you know, what would I do were I in charge, you know? Uh, and it's very similar. I can't deny that standards have slackened. Oh, it's terrible. Um, but one thing I would say is uh, Britain is still a world power. I mean, technically. If, well, no, absolutely. If if we could, you know, muster the will. I mean, like on paper, we look like a world power. I mean, we might not be the top tier up there with China and Russia, uh, China and America, but we're absolutely at the top table. We're in the UN Security Council. We've got nukes. There's only four, five, six countries that have got that. We've got yeah. a nuclear submarine program. Not many countries have got that. We've got an aircraft carrier. Not many countries have got that. We've got a top-notch intelligence program. Not many countries have got that. Sure, but I feel Fifth, that these sixth are... biggest economy in the world. We're up there. Sure, Don't but play I... yourself down. The, the, this... the problem is, like, these things are kind of almost aesthetic considerations that are missing a kind of essential warlike nature that we used to have and we don't have anymore. We're not prepared to put armies in the field anymore. And I really think that. You know, I, I don't think that we could field like 50,000 men in the continent anymore. I don't think the government would have the balls to do it. Blair did it. Blair went to war, what, five, six, seven times? What, with the Iraqis? Yeah, and Afghanistan and Serbia. Okay, and... Yeah. yeah, okay. F fighting a bunch of tribesmen or countries that have like four million people. You mean having a war with like Germany? Yeah. <laughs> I, like we'll just, you know, be able to put like a large army in the field. I don't think we can do it well, against a significant opponent. I don't we've think got we've got Trident. They haven't got anything. So we just but need what about the flat. Russians? You know, if we have Crimea yeah. 2.0, then I, I just don't think we've got the balls to put the men in the field anymore. Like, and uh, we don't, I mean, there's, there are other things like, do we have the population growth to be able to field that number of men? Yeah, do we have the spare sons knocking around? I don't think we do. It's not really about field armies anymore, though, is it? It's well, about, that's, what people, that's, that's what people tell themselves, so that's, that's correct. Well, it's about nuclear missiles, isn't it? If you went to a Russia, say. Well, it's not about nuclear missiles in Ukraine at the moment, is it? So, uh -huh. Fingers crossed. Yeah, but <laughs> Russia could nuke Kiev at an instant notice if it wanted to. Sure, but that... If it wanted to, I it think could people turn would rather stay with conventional war. But anyway, the, yeah. the, the, the point we're getting is, off the point here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm just I'm I'm mildly cynical about these things. Yeah, um, but so yeah, the wars leading up to it. Um, I mentioned lots. If I was quantum leap back in time, I'd do mm. make the sort of put a lot of research and development and energy and money into the army. Lots of uh, rulers throughout time have done exactly that. Mm. Louis XIV is one, is one of those. He came to the throne and he's like, right, let's just make our army. Like we're a land uh, um, nation in Europe. Yeah, we're a land power. We need yeah. to have a top-notch army. And so they spent a few decades basically reforming everything to do with their army to make them the best. And it, it seemed to have worked. I mean, there was a... Uh, they took Artois in the late 1650s. They took Dunkirk in the early 1660s. Um... There's a so-called War of Devolution. They took Lille. Uh, there was there was the Franco-Dutch War we talked about in the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Mm -hmm. There was that one where where Louis just about failed to take all of the United Provinces, but you know still did very well. In the 
1670s, they take Alsace, um, other places. They take Strasbourg mm -hmm. in the 1680s. That's inside the Holy Roman Empire. So by the 1680s, France is not only sort of considered and is the most powerful land force in Europe, it's also throwing its weight around. Mm -hmm. Everyone's aware of it. They're aware of their own power. Everyone's aware of their power. And they're using it. Mm. Um, Louis XIV was no shrinking violet. <laughs> um, in, in 1865, he, the, there's the, he, he revokes the Treaty of, of Nantes. Uh, that's one word I'll, you have to be a bit careful about. The, the, the French town of N -N Nantes. Yeah. It's written, but it's really pronounced Nantes, which sounds like a bad English word, doesn't it? But there's no way to avoid that. I think maybe the French, if you really lean into it, it's more like non. But anyway... We sort of say not Nantes, Nantes. I'll call it Nantes. Anyway, Nantes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stay safe, call it Nantes. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, when Louis revokes that, that's, where, that's when he basically says um, you kind of have to be Catholic. Hmm. Or at least we're going to heavily prosecute Protestants. The more hardline Protestant you are, the more you're going to be in trouble now. And that's when the Huguenots, lots of the Huguenots, yeah. come across to Britain. Um, Always been a nation of immigrants, both for their safety. Yeah, hundred thousand Huguenots can't be wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a million of the million of them a year, year on year. Yeah. Oh no, it wasn't quite that many, was it? It was nowhere near that many. And anyway, by the very late, <laughs> by the very late seventeenth uh, century, you've got the Nine Years' War, which runs from sixteen eighty eight to sixteen ninety seven. Um, where it's basically a lot of Europe against France. There's way more to it than that. Anyone that knows mm. about the Nine Years' War will uh, will scoff at that description. But anyway, that's all you really need to know for this. We haven't got time to go into it. Um, and if that ends in 97, um, then that's not very long before this starts. This starts basically in 1701. Right. Britain don't really get involved till more like 02, 03, but... So it's four years. Yeah, it's not really much of a, of, a, of a breathing space there, really. Churchill writes, quote, No war was ever entered upon with more reluctance on both sides than the war of the Spanish, Spanish succession. Europe was exhausted and disillusioned. That seems to be a little bit of an understatement. Because um, both sides really did everything they could, within reason, to sort of not end up in hostilities. That is interesting, though, isn't it? Where you've got two sides that just don't want a war and yet still find themselves compelled to war anyway. They tried diplomacy, lots of diplomacy, and it just didn't work. It just couldn't work. Because, hmm. you know, sometimes there's a line in the sand. Yeah. It's like, you know, someone says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill one of your parents or one of your kids, but let's talk about it. Let's talk turkey. Let's see if we can arrange something before we do that. You can do absolutely everything you possibly can, hmm. But if they, if at some point they say, no, I don't accept it, then you can say, right, well, I'm, it's a fight then. I'm not just going to let you do it. I'm mm. going to have to fight then. Because I'm not, I'm, I cannot let you do that. So it's what, as simple as that. What so was that's how it ended. Is, what, what, what was that over exactly? Well, because if the House of Bourbon or the House of Habsburg control all of the Spanish empire, mm. they're going to be the world, they're going to be the unipower of the world. Yeah, they're the going to be unbelievably rich. Yeah. Because Spain, the Spanish Empire, although its economy had sort of largely stalled already and its army and navy were pretty poor, um, it still controlled giant swathes of yeah. uh, the New World. Uh, in this, quite often, historians and people at the time, shorthand for the, for the Spanish holdings in the rest of the world are just the Indies, that's what they call it, mm. meaning sort of the East Indies, but they also just mean loads of South America, Loads of it, loads of Mesoamerica and what is Mexico and places, Central America. Often it's just, they just, people just refer to it as the Indies, Spain and the Indies. Hmm. It's just giant, the amount of silver and gold that keeps coming back, even hundreds of years after sort of Drake hmm. and, and Philip II, a couple of hundred years after that. Because the Habsburgs have controlled Spain for sort of 200 years now. So if the Austrian emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, or Louis get control of all of that. It's just, it's just too much. It's, they're, they're too powerful. You sort of can't allow it to happen. And then there's more on top of that. So Spain controlled, like I say, Flanders, the Spanish Netherlands, i.e. basically sort of Belgium, 
bit, bits of Holland, Luxembourg, a bit of France, anyway. Uh, the Milanese, a big chunk of northern Italy around Milan. Uh, also, Naples. Now, Naples is not just the town of Naples. It's all of southern Italy. Mm. It's a big chunk of central Italy. Most of central Italy is controlled by the papacy. But then everything sort of between Rome and Naples. Between Rome and Naples is roughly the border of Naples. And then, it, that's the re- and then the rest of Italy. That's all the kingdom of Naples. Mm. And they controlled Sicily and Sardinia. So mm. that Spain controls all of that. Mm. So if you suddenly link that to the, Aust- the either the House of Habsburg or the Bourbon, the House of Bourbon, then you're in trouble, even if you're Great Britain. So it sort of can't be allowed to happen, in a way. Um, so everyone sees this happening ahead of time, sort of 30 years ahead of time we see it yeah. happening, because Charles II of Spain was terribly, terribly mentally and physically disabled, completely inbred. Oh, is this the guy with the chin? Right. His lower mandible was so deformed he couldn't chew. Hmm. He had to sort of swallow food whole, yeah. which gave him really bad indigestion and just it was just, you can't, you need to chew your food. You yeah. sort of have to do it. And he couldn't really. N- nature telling us this is the end of this bloodline. Yeah, he was, uh, he wasn't uh, like unlucky in love. He could not conceive children. Yeah. Don't want to get too crude about it, but his I, I lower know the, extremities were a, I know the story. a car crash. I'm not I, going to talk I, about it. I know the story. He could they, not have kids. They, they had uh, doctors or whatever come in and examine him, didn't they? And uh, there was something uh, freakishly deformed. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. He was incapable physically of having any children. Yeah. Um, that's the least of it. I mean, like, he was epileptic. He himself thought he was possessed by the devil. One of his nicknames was uh, the Bewitched. Because uh, they used to think that having fits or epilepsy was just yeah. the devil and things. Um, uh, but like that's the least of it. He just kept coming down with every sort of disease you can imagine. I think in his autopsy they discovered he only had one kidney. Jesus. Um, or, or just all sorts of things. Yeah, all these horrible genetic deformities yeah. because of centuries of Habsburg inbreeding. There's at least, I think in his direct line, like the few generations before him, I think four or five times when brothers married sisters or uncles married nieces. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shouldn't really marry your cousins or nieces or siblings. No, marry <laughs> outside of your immediate family. Um, Sage advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... Um, but apart from physically, also mentally, mm. he was um, sort of clinically slow. Mm. Um, apparently he, could, he couldn't speak until he was four. And then until he was in, 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 not until in his adulthood, could he really learn anything? Right. And he was slow of mind. He wasn't um, a complete, he wasn't a vegetable, but not, not far off there. Yeah. Like he sort of knew what was going on, but only really sort of. Hmm. Um, he couldn't really, he couldn't really learn properly. Anyway, even before this, generations before this, the Habsburgs, the Spanish line of the Habsburgs were, um, quite often have kids that died in infancy because they were so inbred. Mm. And he was obviously inbred from birth, so everyone expected him to die in infancy. And if that had happened, the whole thing would have been very different. Also, history would have gone in all sorts of different ways. But he lived to be 38, somehow. Like every year, people are expecting him to die. Mm. And in fact, in the last three, four years of his life, people were expecting him to die any minute, and he just kept living. <laughs> That's very rude, really. He should have really done the decent thing and it's shuffled just, off. But it's just really bizarre that, like, at the top of a vast, world-spanning pyramid of wealth and power, is a an inbred retard. Isn't that just peculiar? That's monarchy. Well, it, it doesn't have to be. I mean, you know, not every monarchy is full of inbreds. But, oh right, yeah, but I mean, yeah. But yeah. if the family line is inbred, then <laughs> yeah. that's that's it. That's what you've got. That's what monarchy is. It passes to this person yeah, no, by no, law, of course, of and course. you've got no choice. It's, it's just a very peculiar state of affairs. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Well, you know, from an outside, an outside, an alien arrives, and it's like, oh look, all of your people are generally quite healthy, apart from the guy who owns everything, who's a disgusting inbred retard. <laughs> what? What is? How have you done that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like. It's, it takes, so, it takes it's, some explaining, doesn't it? You know? We call it primogeniture. <laughs> what, 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 sorry. I'm sure it's got a logic of its own. Um, yeah. 
So obviously, having no children of his own, it was going to pass to somebody else. Yeah. Now the the Austrians, being Habsburgs as well, mm. sort of. Uh, well, Leopold the first and um, Louis have got sort of pretty much more or less the exact same level of claim. Mm. They they're both descended from sisters of that Spanish Habsburg line, and married sisters. Of it, so they've both got very strong claims, mm. and they're both sort of quite equal, sort of on paper. Um, so anyway, people see this coming. People expecting this Charles to die every year, really, and and where they've just come out of the the Nine Years' War, at least in I call it Britain now, even though it's not Britain just yet. But I'll just call it Britain now. Uh, Britain and France. Decide. Let's put our heads together and sort this out because we don't want another sort of European spanning conflagration. We can't really fold it. I suppose this is kind of the advantage of monarchy is that you can see problems coming down the line for decades in advance. Like you know who is related to who and who will inherit from who, and so at least you've got that advantage. Yeah, yeah. Um, they see they see it coming, and they they well they enter into a couple of treaties. The first one about three years before he actually dies, and um, they sort of decide. Well, we, there is a third claimant, a possible third claimant, um, uh, one of the children of the Elector of Bavaria. Um, it's not sort of in the direct line, hmm. but that would sort of solve the power struggle. Um, let it go to a third house, hmm. um, and neither neither of us will have it. Um, but the, that was sort of conducted between Britain and France. And so the Austrians were like, wait, we're not happy with that. We don't agree to any of that. And the Spanish were like, wait, who, we don't agree to any of that. <laughs> who are you to tell us? Uh, so, yeah, anyway, that was, that was the Treaty of the Hague. Hmm. Uh, it was a, 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 a Joseph Ferdinand of Bavaria, a little kid, like a six-year-old kid. Um, but then he just died of smallpox. He just got smallpox and died. So that whole plan Doesn't was scuppered work. straight away. Yeah. So what would have been ideal, what would have probably, what would have prevented Britain and France, the two biggest economies, I suppose you could say, the two sort of best belligerents, mm. what, what would have really probably stopped them from having this war? As a six-year-old with that little boy kid. in yeah. Bavaria. Yeah. Right. But he dies. Um, the next year, in 1699, they, they, they make another treaty, the Treaty of London, sometimes the Second Partition Treaty. Um, and they decide that... Um, so, so now the main claimants come into it. Hmm. Uh, on, the, on the Austrian side, there's a, an Archduke, Archduke uh, Charles VI of Austria, who's like Leopold's son. Um, He's sort of the main claimant. Um, if he were to become King of Spain, he would become Charles III of Spain. Right. He would continue the Habsburg rule of Spain. Uh, and on the uh, French side, there's Lou, one of Louis's grandsons, um, uh, uh, Philip of Anjou, who, if he became King of Spain, would become Philip V of Spain. Hmm. So there's these two claimants. And at the Treaty of London, um, France and, and Britain come to a, an agreement that um, um, you know Philip could take the throne, but must must promise not to. He must be his own thing in Spain. He can't just be the puppet of Louis, right. and he can never sort of legally. We'll write it down, make it legally that he can never inherit France, because that's our worry. That's our main worry. Mm. If France and Spain become one entity. Um, it's just a matter of time till they screw with our commerce and then maybe even us invade us or something. Who knows? Who knows? Well, I mean, they'll be powerful enough to just dominate all of Europe. Mm. Mm. And we, they, all sorts of things are agreed in, in the Treaty of London that certain bit, the other Spanish possessions, like, the, the, like Flanders and the Milanese, will sort of go to Austria and some other other bits and bobs. And the Spanish themselves, again, are like, well, you didn't even invite us to the to the table. Were you even going to ask us? And the main thing we don't like, the Spanish, is that we're not going to split up our empire. Mm. 
Flanders and all our possessions, Naples and Sicily and Milan and, and Spain and the Indies, that's all got to remain under one person, whatever happens. That was their position. Hmm. It's interesting how no one really cares what the Spanish think of this. <laughs> Shows you where the power in Europe is, doesn't it? Like, if you've got this giant empire, why doesn't it feel like you deserve a giant empire? Mm. Yeah, that's the question. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.